On the southern outskirts of Sheffield, the steel city in the Midlands of England, yeah, they think they're northerners, but from Newcastle, they're halfway to London. That's not north. Anyway, is Abbeydale Industrial Hamlet. There, they have some very old water-powered trip hammers. The invention is a fairly old idea, but we don't know exactly how old. Literary sources tell us that the Hellenistic Greeks had them, and pretty certainly the Imperial Romans. And it is thought that by somewhere around the 1st century BC or AD, the Chinese had them. During the Dark Age, we lose track of them, but they reappear in the records in Europe in the 12th century. A lot of the time, they were used for smashing up metal ores that had been mined. Here's a Roman stone anvil that a trip hammer has worn down into this shape. Here's an illustration from Georgius Agricola's treatise on mining, showing a four-hammer crusher powered by a water wheel. They were also used for metalworking. The big plates of late medieval armour were typically made from sheets pounded flat by such machinery. I am unaware of any remaining medieval examples, but we shouldn't expect there to be any. The best sites for building such devices would still have been the best sites centuries later, and so newer machinery replaced old ones on the same spots. The main thing they made at Abbeydale was scythes. We know that there was ironworking here from the 13th century, and they were still hammering out scythes here until 1933. These were the crown scythes, so-called because they had a curved section to the blade, which was convex on the upper side. Very high-quality scythes made of laminated metal. There was a huge and subtle variety in scythe blades available. The workshops were reopened in World War II to help with the war effort, and then the place became a museum in 1970. Most of what you see here today is 19th or late 18th century. We know of a new wheel, presumably water wheel, in operation in 1685, and in 1777 a new dam was built to expand the water power of the site. Here we have a Jessop tilt hammer, named after William Jessop. It is clearly from a time when iron was getting cheaper, but it's still pretty early, somewhere around 1811. It was brought to the museum for display and isn't where it was used. It's impressively immense. On one side you see a gargantuan hammer which is lifted up by its head and dropped. On the other, another huge hammer has the end of its haft pushed down by the same cam which lifts the head to the same effect. Here is the big wheel, big for better leverage, which once drove the whole thing. It looks as though there was once a second set of hammers there. The teeth on these cam wheels, held in with pins pushed in from the sides, were removable, so you could adjust the frequency of hammer blows. They were also of different sizes, which changed the height the hammer fell from. The pivot points for the hammers were also very adjustable, as you see here. Even in the days of steel, for the long hammer haft, it seems that wood was best. It had a bit of flex. Hello, weapon fans! Look! A Turkish Kalkrish for disemboweling light infantry. Oh, no, it's for turnips. Sheffield is the town that made and sold so many knives and forks that they had to invent new kinds of cutlery just so that they could sell everyone another set. And so was born the cake fork and the fish knife and many more. The mark Sheffield on a steel item was a proof of quality. So, why did Sheffield become the home of the steel industry? Was it where the best iron ore was? No. The reason is, as so often, fluvial. From the west, clay and wood for charcoal could be transported in by boat along the rivers Loxley, Rivelin and Porter. Lead and lime came from the north down the Blackburn. Coal and sandstone for grinding wheels came from the east down the Rother. Swedish iron ore came via the port of Hull up the River Don, and finished goods went the other way to all points east, including Australia, or went northwest along the Don to Liverpool and all other points west. And powering the trip hammers were the Don and the Sheaf to the south, where the Abbeydale works were. There were once 160 water powered works in this area. Coal, if heated in an airless container, turns to coke, and in 1709 Abraham Darby perfected the use of coke for making iron. This replaced charcoal and made the whole process a lot cheaper, as well as saving an awful lot of forests. In 1742, clock and watchmaker Benjamin Huntsman developed the crucible steel process in Sheffield. Steel suddenly got a lot better. They started making it here in the 1830s, and Abbeydale is still the last place in Britain that still uses Huntsman's methods. 
In 1779, the famous Iron Bridge at Ironbridge, Shropshire, was built. That's right, an entire bridge made out of iron, an unthinkably expensive way to make a bridge not long before. In the same year, a chap called John Wilkinson demonstrated that an iron boat will float. Would iron ever get cheap enough to make whole ships out of it? Presumably not. Oh, but in 1784, Henry Court invented the puddling process and iron production rates boomed. In 1856, in Sheffield again, Henry Bessemer invented his eponymous process and steel got so cheap that massive all-iron armoured warships were no longer the stuff of insane imaginings. It was a bit like our making jet fighter planes out of diamond. Oh, great material and we do lots with it, but it's a bit expensive at the moment and only available in little bits. Ha-ha! Ow! 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 what's that? Ah, uh, right. Oh, that was a mistake. Okay. I should get a stunt man, really. Uh, uh, well, at least I found this spoon, so uh, swings and roundabouts, eh? Uh, sponsor! Yes, it's sponsor time, which was why I leapt in like that. Uh, and my sponsor is Wondrium! And what's Wondrium? Oh, right. Uh, well, it used to be called The Great Courses Plus, but now it's called Wondrium, which is combined with some other... It's just, just more and bigger, and it, it's now called Wondrium. So now you know. Oh, uh, and it's uh, lots and lots of lecture courses on all sorts of topics. Videos uh, by distinguished professors from distinguished universities telling you stuff that you might want to know. And on all sorts of topics, you're bound to find something you'd like, I'd have thought. And, and you can trust these guys because they've got qualifications. I mean, not like just some YouTuber. You might want some knowledge and think, oh, I'll just type something into YouTube. And then you get someone like me. Am I qualified? Do you know? I mean, they, frankly, they just let anyone make YouTube videos these days. Uh, but on Wondrium, no, 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 no. It's, it, it's people who know their stuff. And, um, and if you're watching this video, you're quite likely, for instance, to be interested in Norse mythology because, you know, you're interested in history and, and, and maybe fantasy, you're in, maybe into, into role-play gaming and Tolkien, and, and you like Vikings! Vikings! Yeah, um, and uh, so they go, they've got a whole course on Norse mythology. Uh, now, I suppose uh, I, sh I should, um, for complete uh, disclosure, uh, say that when we look at this, it's not the greatest use of gesture, that uh, very little cradle work. It's generally this very laid back, parallel waving. So I don't think I can really, uh, with a clear conscience, sell this course uh, on the quality of its gestures. But you, you learn stuff about, well, Norse mythology. Obviously, for instance, I learned about v Valkyries. Now, I don't know what your introduction to the Valkyrie was. Uh, I don't know what age you are. Uh, maybe it was the, the video game Gauntlet, uh, and you, 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 you adventured around the dungeon, picking up keys and, and, and running away from those death things that would bzz and drain your life, and, and hearing noises. Valkyrie, your life force is running out. Yeah, like those. Well, uh, I'm sorry to have to break it to you, but uh, the Valkyrie in, in that game was not absolutely strong strictly adhering to uh, the origins, uh, the Valkyrie's origins in Norse mythology. Or maybe um, uh, you, you uh, I, I can remember, for instance, that my um, introduction to the Valkyrie was that I was told that they were these, these flying beasts that would, that would um, fly down onto battlefields and, and, and take away the bodies of the fallen. And so I imagined them with their big wings and their teeth and their talons and, and go swooping down. And then after a battle, um, a load of guys, who you know, they're on the victory side and oh we've just won a battle phew and Valkyrie and the dun 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 dun, dun, dun the swooping in oh, the teeth and the talons and the guys and bring up spears trying to fend them off could you imagine something the weight of a human its gliding speed would be pretty huge and the, the weight of a human the momentum you wouldn't want to be in front of a, a gliding human just whoosh, dun, 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 dun. but in fact um that's not really quite right either. Uh, Val, uh, Wagner, you know, some of you I, I'm sure are opera buffs, or at least you've seen those pictures, haven't you, of the, of the fat lady with a big winged helmet and the breastplate going, oh, 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 only better. And uh, well, it turns out that that guy Wagner, who was German, by the way, um, did not take liberties. And you could say he was, even, he was making it up. And according to the ring cycle, if you've lived all the way through that, um, they were the nine daughters of Odin. No, they weren't. He, he made that up. No, if you can look at the, the origins in the North my Norse myths um, back in the day, um, they were, in fact, mortal women. Uh, it was um, Being a Valkyrie was like a job you could get. 
Uh, Brunhild, the most famous of the lot, uh, she took an oath when she was 12 years old to serve Odin. Uh, you had to remain single, that was one of the rules, and if you married you got thrown out. You see, you could lose the job as well as get it. Uh, Brunhild, uh, I think, uh, lost her job because she got the wrong king killed and Odin wasn't happy, so uh, she got uh, chucked out, she lost the job. So you can th if you're into roleplay gaming you might think, oh, so Valkyrie is like a character class. You can actually take an oath, become a servant of Odin, and then you get to fly because they didn't have wings, they had sort of feathery cloaks that gave them the magical ability to fly. And uh, you would you'd have to serve in Valhalla, but that was considered to be an honor, so that, that, that's all right. Uh, so there were there were definite perks. I dare say the food was good. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, so you'll find out lots of stuff like that if you, you, take, you know, watch stuff on Wondrium. Uh, but maybe you wouldn't like it. Uh, maybe you would. Oh wait a minute! If you go to wondrium.com stroke Lindy Beige, you will find their details of a free trial so you can just try it out for free and it's just unlimited during during that uh, trial period you can just go all the way around the site looking at all sorts of stuff don't don't overdo it though do you know leave some time for sleep um and if you like it you can become a permanent subscriber and that would be good so uh, uh there you go wondrium these are the products scythes Ooh, a proper one with side handles at different angles and an s-curved shaft Hay knife, grass hook, beet knife, none of that multi purpose rubbish. Three pieces of steel yep. to start off a side. Yep. The middle piece is mm -hmm. what they used to use is, is shear steel. They called it shear steel, which was like a slightly higher com carbon content. Mm -hmm. So when they, when they put it in there, heated it up to a temperature about 1000 degrees, and then it would be, be hammered and start welding it. You can see. You can start welding it together mm -hmm. and then keep pruning it back if you need it more. What, what would happen then is. Let's show you the next one. Uh -huh. So that. Stage two. So they've now been. Fused. That's been welded together and they've put a tack, they've, they've banged a tang on that side. Mm -hmm. What they would do now is split that and put it back on this side and draw that out similar. If they were, it depends what size side they were going to make. Mm -hmm. These two have stopped now. What? Alas, I didn't capture on camera the impressively sudden acceleration of the wheel. I can adjust the speed now to what, you know, you can control the speed from here. This upper rod, when twisted, moves a wedge which controls the flow of water from the main upper tank. Gravity is kept switched on at all times so that all that potential energy is just ready to go. Here there is another control regulating water to a second smaller water wheel that powered the bellows. There were once four water wheels in operation here. This flow adjusting control has a simple but effective way of holding a desired rate. Teeth on the stick and a peg to rest one on. Now this I love. This water-powered axle once turned and these beautifully curving three-pointed cams over which rode a wheel in a tipping beam worked these vertical rods up and down which powered these drums set into the ceiling. They were huge bellows and these blew air along this pipe across the ceiling and down to this junction with its two valves. Mm, valves which regulated airflow to the 1000 degree furnace on the right and the 900 degree one on the left. A drawer like hopper for coke. At the end of the main drive shaft is this eccentric cam which works a bar above it up and down which works a gigantic pair of cast iron snippers. Here you see the powerful jaws. The bottom hard steel blade is in place with a wooden wedge next to it but the upper blade is missing. In one turn of the drive shaft, this would snip through a thick billet of steel. The hammer operator made about 84 scythe blades a day. He sat on a seat suspended on a single iron rod which gave him great freedom of movement. Beneath was a shallow trough filled with sand or water. If he accidentally dropped a very hot bit of metal, this would catch it gently and safely. Do you see how each wooden tooth is individually replaceable? With one tooth in every socket on these cams, the hammering could be made very rapid. Adjustable pivot points again. The frame is a mix of stone, wood and cast iron. 
The main drive shaft could run many drive belts that could be connected and disconnected as needed. Here you see a belt-driven grinding wheel. Before and after rubber arrived in Britain in the 18th century, leather was used for perfectly serviceable drive belts. This design of water-powered trip hammer was in its heyday 1720 to 1850. This one dates from 1742, although I dare say that it has been upgraded and repaired so many times since then that little from that year remains. Abbeydale was unusual in that it was a fairly complete factory. It made its own crucible steel on site. Here you see the furnaces, where the crucibles would be heated for about four hours before the puller out, his legs wrapped in water-soaked cloth, would extract them and the teamer would pour out the metal into ingots. One thing I'm going to guess about the Victorian workers who were down here is that uh, they weren't terribly tall. Clay crucible pots made here on site. Each could hold 56 pounds of molten iron. These look used, but not much, because a pot would typically last just two or three uses. So this is where the pots were made. On this floor here, you see this large tray, that would be filled with clay, and that would be trodden for hours to get it just right. And then a lump of it would be put into one of these pots, and then you'd put that plug into the pot, and then belt it with one of these absolutely enormous mallets and uh, that would shape the crucible. So this tool was used to curl in the top of the crucible when it was still soft clay. I have on a few occasions on Roman archaeological sites excavated crucibles and bits of slag and very quickly you get to know to recognise it. It has this particular lumpy, uh, bubbly quality. It's often quite multicoloured, like oil in water. The charge room, where the highly secret assortment of ingredients was weighed out and mixed before being taken to the crucibles. A large planter for greenery? No, that's a hammerhead. This is a swage block. It's like an anvil for lots and lots of specialist tasks. Here's one mounted in a stout holder for use. Six blacksmiths worked here, tempering blades and making repairs and a hundred other tasks. Insulation for a slate roof? It was probably warm enough when they were working. They also made their own patented riveted scythes which were lighter and cheaper. These were put together in the boring shop, named after the drilling done for the rivet holes, although it does look pretty dull to me. The blacking shop where women painted the finished blades with a black varnish to protect against rust and packed them in straw rope for export. The longest scythe blades I saw here were about five feet long. Let your imaginations loose now, viewers, as you imagine what the heck could have charred three great lumps out of the side of this very primitive stool. Is it a shovel? Is it a sieve? It's both! It's a shovel sieve. It's a shiv. This steam engine is working and in its original position. It didn't supersede the water wheel exactly, but instead was the backup power in case the wheel went out of action, perhaps because the water level behind the dam was a bit low. It powered the grindstones. The life expectancy of the grinders was very low because the fine hot dust of sandstone gave them silicosis, much like flint nappers used to get. They worked in the grinding hull. You could probably find it by following a man with a bad cough. That huge chimney on the right is above the crucible furnaces. Stables. Carriage. The manager's house. Did everyone have a pair of pottery dogs back then? My granny had a rug like that. Coming soon. Pantry. In a small room. There's nowhere to run.